this is my wife Teresa and I'm going to cut her hair today if she sits still which she doesn't normally so um, because of that I often slip and wet her face with the water when I'm shampooing but she's told me she'll give me a whack if I do so I'm trying to be good <laughs> Hi there, my name's Mark and this is my sister Chris and um, obviously we're here cutting hair today, this is our salon, we're joint um, owners and um, we just want to, I just want to tell you a story of what happened to me through my life. So, um, I mean I started ha hairdressing because of my sister Chris. Um, and that obviously was a long time ago, probably about 23, 24 years ago. Um, Chris was doing hairdressing and um, she came home one day and asked if I would go and help at the salon. And that was a bit of a challenge to me. Um, my dad was in the army for 24 years as a weapon instructor. Um, and um, I've always, I always wanted to go into the army, into the forces like my dad. Um, so going into hairdressing or going into help seemed a bit strange. But to be honest, I knew there'd be a lot of girls there. So um, that's what really tempted me. Um, so I went in and, you know, 20, 30 years later, here I am still cutting hair with my sister. So uh, we obviously get on well. Um, yeah, so I started hairdressing and um, we worked in town, Berris and Edmonds, in a shop in, in the town centre for um, together for a while and really enjoyed enjoyed the work so and I remember Chris coming home one day which was uh, quite strange and said she was going to a confirmation class at uh, a church called Southgate Church and she invited me along and asked if I wanted to go with her and I didn't really know anything about Christianity or anything like that so I went along um, we went to classes I think I skipped a few so I didn't really get to hear the full sort of thing. Um, and Chris went on and, and got baptised at Southgate Church. So, and I, I just wasn't interested at all, wasn't interested, couldn't, I can't remember anything about it. Had a big group of friends in Bury. It was the first town I'd stayed in for a long time because obviously Dad being in the army, we always moved about. We always moved after two or three years. So to come to Bury at the age of 13 and, and to, to be in Bury at that age and to grow up and suddenly I'm 18, I've you know, obviously been in Bury five years, I've got proper friends that I'm going to stay with. Um, we all liked soul music, we all liked dancing and going to clubs and we used to go on these um, soul weekends. I mean that was down at Caister, we all used to pile down there, there was probably about 30 of us. We used to dress the same. We were called the Berry Funk Regiment because um, we loved funk music. We loved that type of music. So um, we used to go down to Yarmouth for weekends and stuff like that. Chris used to come. She was a member of the Berry Funk Regiment. And uh, we, we had a good time, but obviously a lot of drinking, a lot of um, things. And I remember once we went to a place called the Fish and Duck. I think it's near Ely somewhere or Denver Sluice, I think it's called. Um, and we went there um, to a nightclub and a friend of mine um, had moved to London and just come home and he had started smoking marijuana and I remember him introducing me to it and he asked if I'd like a little smoke of marijuana so we went outside the nightclub and we had a little spliff which is a name for marijuana, you know, uh, a joint that you smoke and uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I just laughed and giggled all night and we had a really good, good evening. Um, so I was quite interested in this stuff and I suppose growing up with a dad, my dad's from Jamaica or Costa Rica, my dad's into Bob Marley and sort of reggae music. I grew up with a lot of black artists, um, Sam Cooke, um, Brooke Benton, um, Jackie Wilson and people like that so I love that sort of music and it seemed just so right to smoke this stuff and listen to this type of music um, so I started smoking a lot of marijuana um, and I'm still listening to a lot of reggae music and stuff like that but a lot of soul music as well 
Um, that started, some of my friends moved to London. And um, I remember a friend of mine, Sean, moved down to London. I went and stayed with him. Um, he was very much into his drugs and I had a brilliant weekend on drugs. I thought it was great. Um, I couldn't wait to get back. So eventually I decided to move to London. Um, and I actually moved to London and moved into a squat in London, which is obviously a place where, you know, I'm, I wasn't supposed to be. Um, rent free, so you didn't, it didn't cost any money. So obviously um, I had more money to spend on drugs and stuff like that. So I loved going to nightclubs. Um, I loved doing um, drugs. So and we, uh, one of the drugs that you tend to do at nightclubs is called speed. And speed basically um, is a, you know, in London was the drug to take if you were going to nightclubs because you could stay up all night. Um, uh, you, you know, literally, I mean, I wasn't a, a good drinker. I couldn't drink a lot. And then when I started doing speed, I discovered I could keep up with everybody else drinking and, you know, and stay up all night. Uh, the downside at the time, the only downside I could see was that in the morning, probably seven, eight, nine in the morning, when you start coming down off it, you just felt a mess. Found it really hard getting up, so you generally had the next day in bed. Um, but this is the drug you take, and um, very, very um, quickly got the nickname Speed Freak, because I loved um, um, speed. And what they don't tell you is, obviously, we used to put it in a Rizzler paper and put it in the back of our mouths when we went into nightclubs. So you could just slowly come up on it, but they don't tell you that you end up losing all your teeth. And I've always had problems with my teeth because of speed. Um, so anyway, yeah, we used to go to nightclubs. We ended up, we were into this psychobilly scene, sort of rockabilly scene, and it, it still incorporated the music I liked. It still, um, the music, even though it was like this rockabilly scene, psychobilly scene, it was all, you still had Jackie Wilson, we still had Sam Cooke, it all fitted in nicely. So it was right up my street. Um, so I remember being in Bury, probably 25, 30 years ago, shaving my head off, the hair off my head, and just having a horn at the front. And I thought, I thought I looked great. <laughs> um, got very strange looks in Bury all the time. <coughs> And uh, used to go to London every weekend, um, moved to London, loved it and uh, loved the whole scene. But after a few years of doing that, it seemed to lose its, um, I don't know, I just didn't seem to enjoy it anymore. But by this time, I was really enjoying the drugs that I was taking. I loved speed. I loved Sense Amelia. I loved um, all sorts of, uh, of drugs. I came back to Bury. I knew my friends in Bury were smoking a lot. And actually, it was easier to get drugs in Bury than it was in London. It was um, quite difficult to get them in London because I didn't have the contacts there. Whereas in Bury, um, we have the port of Felixstowe down the road. Um, I could, you know, drugs came in quite a lot then. So it was quite easy. We used to have people in Ipswich we used to get drugs off. And uh, I found it easier and, and, and I just had a real craving. I was spending a lot of money on drugs every week. And that was the most important thing for me. I moved back in with mum and dad, and I feel so sorry for them now when I think about it. I had two big bass bins in my bedroom, and I just had this ragger pumping out all the time. It was very aggressive, um, all about money and drugs and um, all sorts of issues. Um, started getting into a bit of the um, uh, sort of Rasta man scene. There was a pub in Ipswich called the Blue Coat Boy. I used to go over there. My nickname over there was Sinbad. Um, and it's funny because I'm not black and I'm, I've got a bit of color, so they didn't know how to take me, but I had dreadlocks by this time. So I started growing my hair into sort of big dreadlocks. Bought one to show you today. This was my favorite little one that I used to play with all the time. And this was here on the side of my head. And I always used to sit there when I was smoking drugs, just twiddling this bit of hair. So didn't wash and comb my hair for seven years. So when we go and do these hair talks, we go to ladies groups, um, yeah, WI groups and things like that um, with my wife, Teresa. And um, 
they love seeing things like that. I leave it on the table and encourage them to open it up and see what's in there, because that was seven years of not washing and combing. Quite interesting from a hairdresser's point of view. Um, but yeah, I started getting a bit heavier into drugs. Um, I mentioned the word sense Amelia, and it's, it's, it's a, a grass marijuana, but it, it's what Jamaicans smoke a lot. It's much, much stronger than the normal stuff that you would um, smoke. Um, and again, the first time I smoked that, it was one little Rizzler with a bit of um, sense Amelia in it. And I laughed because I smoked quite a lot. And so when someone passed me this one little thing, I thought, ah, smoked it, hallucinated, and I loved it. I've always looked towards fantasy rather than reality. And obviously I wasn't coping with reality very well. And um, I couldn't do hairdressing. I, I mean, when you're doing speed, the problem with speed is you do it on a Saturday night. Um, you wake up Sunday feeling really, really rough. So then you take another line of speed, which costs you about five quid. Um, so you okay on Sunday. Then you wake up Monday for work and you're feeling rough. So you have to take another line for work. And then you want to go out Monday night. So you take another line. So suddenly you're, and I think, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure at one point I probably went about two weeks without not taking it. And it, it, it affects your body and it affects the way you think. So I was finding it very, very difficult to, um, to do hairdressing and to communicate with people. I only, I only liked people like me. You know, I only liked people that were into drugs. I only talked to people that done that sort of thing. And I really wasn't interested pretty much in anyone else. Yeah, so I've been home for a while. Um, and I was getting very much into the drug scene. We loved um, Ickworth Park, which is a beautiful, beautiful park up in Bury, um, owned or was owned then by the Marquis of Bristol. And it was open to anyone. And uh, we used to get ready at weekends. Friday night, we'd put a bottle of water in a rucksack, waterproof clothing, that's all we really needed. And that was it for the weekend. We'd go up there, we'd do LSD, two, three, four micro dots. Um, I remember um, actually taking these LSD things and, and realised that I actually couldn't remember my name. And I can't remember, maybe a day, two days, it took me to remember who I was, my name. And it was a laugh. We saw it as a laugh. Um, we used to do it all the time. And unfortunately, it, it becomes the norm. And... Um, we used to go on adventures with it. We used to go to Sherwood Forest and dress up as Robin Hood and really almost believe that we were Robin Hood and went to Glastonbury. Um, it was probably the first time I'd done mushrooms, magic mushrooms. I loved them. I started doing quite a lot of them. Then found out I could actually go and pick them in Bury in <coughs> September's, it's September month. I could go and pick mushrooms from Ickworth Park for free. So we used to go up there and pick them. And we found other fields that we could get them from. Um, and we also knew that the police couldn't do anything about it because they weren't dried. They only, um, they only can arrest you for mushrooms if they're dried out. So we used to keep them damp all the time and uh, do those. Um, every, every week we would be doing LSD or, or mushrooms. Um, all my friends were into drugs, everyone I knew. Um, so whoever's house I went round in Bury, we just um, you know, got into drugs. And then I think with drugs, it always leads into this sort of fantasy world, which is something I've always been interested in. And um, we started playing Dungeons and Dragons and things like this. And uh, my friend's mum let us have a plot of land out at Risby. And um, we went out there and we built what we called a Saxon hut. Um, just like there's a local historical site in Bury um, with Saxon huts on. So we tried to replicate one of those, took us about a year. And then we went out there to play these fantasy games and we used to do LSD, but we weren't allowed anything modern apart from a lighter. Obviously we had a lighter, but all our food was wrapped up in cloth. We had raw chicken wrapped up in cloth and we could cook that on a fire. Everything was sort of tried to be authentic. We actually, I actually went to one of the local historical sites and stole all the um, uh, 
buckets and spades and everything from there. Um, so it looked really authentic. Um, and we got into this fantasy world, which I absolutely loved. I was a warrior and I always loved being a warrior. I had big swords and we had the whole caboodle, a bit like Conan the Barbarian. We were into all of that. So um, that went on for a few years and totally wrapped up in that, in the characters that we had. We developed characters, um, but really believed it was us, you know. Um, I mean, I really, really believed that one day I would walk to a tree in Ickworth Park and the tree would open and I would go into a, a different world and I was waiting for it to happen, I was ready. Went back to London um, and I moved in with my brother Paul. My brother Paul was into drugs. I used to, he used to be in the Berry Funk Regiment. I love my brother Paul, um, very close. Um, we used to go clubbing, he was involved in all the night clubbing with me. I was always with my brother Paul. And I moved in with him, he'd got a flat in East Ham um, we just got it. He'd always been squatting in London and this was his first flat. So, um, moved, in, moved in with him. Um, still couldn't do hairdressing. Um, I went for a job, worked in a salon in Romford for a while, but I found it really, really difficult because of the, the drugs I was into and I was still quite heavy. Um, and then I just had this one night where I stayed up, I had plenty of drugs, so I should have been happy, because um, that's what made me happy. Um, I had drugs on me, um, I had LSD, I remember I had speed, I had a big lump of marijuana, probably half an ounce, and I sat on the floor in his flat, and I didn't know why, but I just couldn't help but cry. And I just kept crying, and I knew that there was nothing, I wasn't happy really with anything else in my life apart from drugs and everything I earned went on drugs. Um, and what I did, I don't know if you can see this, I actually had two bits of paper and these are them, this original ones from all those years ago, 15, 14 years ago. And um, these, I started writing on one bit of paper all the things that I didn't want in my life anymore. So, on another bit of paper, I started to write all the things that I did want in my life. And I was quite surprised because I put God and Jesus, um, I put security, I put um, a consistent job, I put nice clothes, I put peace. Um, there's all sorts of things on there. Teeth, because I knew my teeth were really um, going downhill. So I put those, those things on there. and. Um, didn't know at the time that they were going to happen. Um, cried most of the night. My brother's a chef, so he got up early in the morning to go to work. Um, left about four o'clock in the morning. And I always remember him coming into the, the front room and just looking at me. And to this day, I'm sure he said, what's happened to you? And he'd seen my younger brother become a Christian. And he, he straight away could see there was something different about me that was similar to what my brother John had got. Uh, he went off to work and I decided that morning I was just going to come back to Bury. So I got a bag, packed it. So yeah, I was at uh, Redbridge um, trying to get a, a hitch to Bury. There was two girls in, standing on, on the actual motorway waiting to get a lift as well. And uh, I was pretty sure that if anyone came along, they would pick them up rather than me. So I thought, well, I don't stand a chance. I'm going to be here all day. First car that came along, great big Jag, and it was one of my friends from Bury, Yorkie. And he picked me up, and he had been working in London Friday, Thursday, Friday night, and was coming back to Bury. So he dropped me right at my door, and, um, and I was back in Bury just like that. But I was so excited, I just couldn't... I didn't know what to say to people. I just felt completely different. Just got back to Bury, and there was my brother with his wife. Um, they pulled over and uh, I just said to him, I said, I think I've changed. And it was at that point that I realized I'd left all my drugs in London. And I was really shocked that actually I didn't even think about them. And I just couldn't get over it. And I was talking to my brother, John, and he didn't believe me, he thought, because I used to pick on him, I used to bully him, I used to, he lived with me for a while as a Christian, just for a little while, and um, 
I used to tease him all the time. I used to put my arm around him, even though I was stoned out of my head. And he'd be sitting there with his guitar, strumming away, singing to the Lord. And I'd say, if you ever need help, brother, I'm there for you. And I, I thought it was him that had lost it, and it was me that was okay. Um, and he was saying, I can't believe you. And I said, I have. I think something's happened to me. I feel so different. And I said, I've just realised I've left all my drugs in London. I didn't even think about bringing them back to Bury. I couldn't believe it. So um, I went and asked my mum if I could move back in with her and told my mum and dad that something had happened to me and I wasn't quite sure what. Um, I shoo them my two bits of paper with um, all the things that I wanted to change and the things that, um, I, you know, that I wanted in my life. And I shoot them that I put Jesus and I said I was going to go to church. So I started going to the CRC, which is the church I belong to now. But the one thing that I really, really missed when I became a Christian is that, I mean, my house, everything I owned was new age. It was all yin and yangs, rainbows, incense, you know, all of this. All my clothes smelt of this nag shampoo and, you know, all this... Um, oils and everything so I pretty much bin the lot decided to get rid of the whole lot and start again but the one thing I know that God told me to do is to get rid of all my music the ragger that I liked um you Roy Dr Alan Montado I used to love all of that um uh Shabaranks and so and I had probably a hundred hundred and fifty albums that I had to bin so I binned them and I really struggled with that. And I, as soon as I heard Christian music, worship music, I really enjoyed it and I really liked it. Um, but I knew that I just wanted something else and I missed having this ragger, this heavy sort of bass sound. And um, after a, a few years, my brother Paul became a Christian who used to go clubbing with me and, and was in the Berry Funk Regiment. Um, and it was an incredible thing that happened to him. Um, all his drinking, all his drugs went the first day he gave his life to God. And I was absolutely amazed because I never ever thought that he would become a Christian. So, and obviously he felt the same about me. Um, but he sent me a couple of CDs down because he still lived in London. He could get hold of um, CDs that I couldn't. And some of these CDs were just unbelievable. It was real heavy ragger. And they were guys that I'd sort of known before in the ragga scene, but they, um, they'd brought out their own stuff and they'd been in prison and come out and become Christians and started um, using different words in their songs. And, and most of the sort of ragga that I liked, they sung about Sense Amelia a lot because that's what they took all the time as, as Rasta men. And, um, and I loved songs with Sense Amelia in, and they started changing the words. Um, and my ladies that come in when I do their hair, I often pick a brush up and start singing, and they all laugh, but I like ragga. And, and so one of the songs that I liked, it used to go, you know, they used to sing that they loved Sense Amelia, but then it went into, um, this guy changed it, changed it round, and it was, me love me Jesu, yes me love him. Ma. Me love me Jesu, yes, me love him. Me said, anywhere you go, you hear me vibe like this. Love me Jesus, yes, me love him to bits. Jesus is a man, he makes big business, and he makes a man grow from rags to riches. Me love me Jesu, yes, me love him. And I love that sort of stuff. And suddenly, it was Christians doing it, and I could really relate to it. And um, I, one of the other tracks on the album I'd heard ages ago, and they changed the words... And, it's, and it, they, it just kicked in and it was, there's no other way that a man can be saved. So we're jumping up and down and we're lifting up a name of Jesus. I said, there's no other way that a man can be saved. So we're jumping up and down and we're lifting up a name of Jesus. And I love stuff like that. And I, I couldn't believe that these guys were doing that. I was really excited and it was like, God knew I needed it and I needed that type of music. Uh, so I pump it out in my car all the time. My wife loves it. So I've got the perfect wife that loves the type of music that I like. And I mean, Teresa herself was into rave music and, and that type of music as well. So, and done the same thing, had to get rid of all her CDs, all her rave CDs, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds worth of CDs binned just so we, we could move on, you know. And, um, 
the, the word that kept coming to me when I became a Christian was born again. And I wanted to be born again. Um, and, and like that song, there's no other way that a man can be saved. Uh, so we're jumping up and down and we're lifting up the name of Jesus. There was another song after that and it used to go, Born again, born again, me shout it out loud. How can you be a Christian and your neighbour never know? It's a make your mind up time, hurry up, you're too slow. Are you ready? Get steady on your marks, get set, go. And I love songs about being born again and they're really bouncy, sort of happy ragger. And I love that. And here I am, you know, I've got the music I love still. I'm working with my sister in the salon. We own a salon together. And one of those was saying about making, you know, rags to riches. And not long ago, I was in London foraging around in skips and all sorts of things, waiting at the back of pizza places to get pizzas that were thrown out so I could eat. And, and here we are now, you know, 12, 15 years later, whatever it is, have a salon. But that's not rags to riches to me. It's about how I feel inside. I feel rich inside and I feel happy. <laughs> And the paper that I wrote, all those things on that, those paper, that bit of paper that I wrote about um, the things that I wanted in my life, God's done that, you know, and there is a genuine joy and happiness and contentment in my life. And it, it doesn't end there with Christianity, you know, that, that's where most people, when they do their testimony, finish. But there's so much more, you know, I've been to the Ukraine, I've been to Africa, doing missionary work. I love doing stuff like that. I know that that's what God wants me to do and that's where my heart is. I love being abroad. I love being with different cultures, uh, I suppose because of my family. My dad's mum was Spanish. My dad's dad is Jamaican. My dad's Costa Rican. I, me and Chris were born in Hong Kong. My brothers and sisters were born in Germany. So we have no preference. <laughs> Any country will do. And we love, you know, I just love people. And, it, and that's the thing, you know, when I was into drugs, it was a certain group of people that I had love for. But now I love everyone, you know, old, young. I can sit, I mean, when we go on holiday, we sit with older people and we love talking to them, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know, we love older people. We can sit with teenagers. We just love people. And, and God has changed my heart completely towards people. and. I just feel a lot of love and a lot of joy and I think sometimes it gets on people's nerves here because I come skipping in singing and smiling and they'll say what's wrong with you you think well actually I'm just happy <laughs> is that all right um, and it's lovely it's lovely to feel loved it's lovely to feel secure and the things that we all want are those things security love and I feel whole and I feel a whole person and I can lose a tooth you know, I, can, I could have the scruffiest clothes on, but I still know that I'm a prince. Amen. Come on. Yeah. That's it. And she's done. I can't bear the smell, I can't bear the noise, got no money to be out of it's got no choice. Rats in the front room, roaches in the back, junkies in the alley with a baseball bat. Tried to get away, but I couldn't get far, because the man who possessed me, he possessed my car.